Welcome to the second session of this RCEP webinar on applications of carbon dioxide measurements for climate-related studies. My name is Erica Podest, and I am an RCEP instructor and a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I study terrestrial ecosystems with satellite data. Today's session will focus on the impacts of drought on CO2. It will start with a theoretical part and will be followed by a demonstration on how to access and analyze OCO2 data in relation to drought impacts. As a reminder, this is the agenda for this webinar series. Today is the second session. The third and last session will be next Tuesday, July 16th at the same time. And that third session will be focused on CO2 measurement over a large urban area. I'd like to remind you that there will be a homework associated with this webinar series. We will open the homework on the last session. So we will open the homework on Tuesday, July 16th, and the homework due date will be on August 9th. There will be a certificate given to those participants that attend all the live sessions and complete the homework by the due date. Our guest instructors today are Dr. Junji Liu from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She's the science team lead for the OCO2 and OCO3 missions. David Moroni, also from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is applied science system engineer with the OCO2 and OCO3 missions. And Karen Yuan from JPL as well is the application lead for OCO2 and OCO3. The objectives of this session are for participants to be able to identify effects from El Nino that can create regional drought conditions, monitor global fluxes of atmospheric CO2 concentrations to identify areas that are vulnerable, use OCO2 data to visualize areas that have been impacted, and do interpretive and comparative analysis. So this is with U Jupyter Notebook identify methods and processes to derive fluxes with atmospheric CO2 measurements, and interpret regional flux perturbations and country-scale fluxes and emissions. And finally, follow steps to clone the RCET GitHub repository and maintain the local code. As a reminder how to ask questions, please write your questions in the questions box and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. And feel free to write your questions as we go along through the presentation. We'll try to answer all of the questions during the Q&A uh, after the webinar, but if we don't get to your question, all of them will be answered. We will be compiling them onto a Google Doc, and we will be sharing this Google Doc with all of you a couple of days after this session ends. So we will post it on the uh, training webpage. Now we will start the presentation. Dr. Yunji Liu will be covering the theoretical portion, um, discussing atmospheric CO2 concentrations and carbon fluxes. And then we will move into a demo led by Karen Yuan and then David Moroni on how to uh, generate figures of atmospheric CO2 concentrations and fluxes. Okay, uh, welcome to the second part of the RSA training. Uh, I'm Junjie Liu. In this part of the RSA training, I will show um, how to interpret column CO2 concentration observed by OCO2, uh, the link between uh, uh, CO2 concentration and surface carbon fluxes, and how to interpret drought signals in both atmospheric CO2 concentration and surface carbon fluxes. You will be able to generate most of the plots I show in this presentation with Jupyter Notebooks later. Um, so those who attended part one uh, have seen this and the next slide. Um, so I will quickly go over these two slides. Uh, so this slide shows both OCO2 and OCO3 um, show column CO2 concentration um, in the Northern Hemisphere is much higher uh, in April um, than in August uh, in the same year. 
So the CO2 concentration in uh, is higher in the Northern Hemisphere than in the Southern Hemisphere uh, in April, but lower um, in August. The CO2 concentration is also higher uh, in East Asia, um, America, and Europe than uh, other regions. Um, this shows a column CO2 concentration observed by OCO2 as a function of uh, time and the latitude. It shows this steady increase of atmospheric CO2 concentration with time. So with about a 2.5 parts per million per year increasing rate. It also shows that the Northern Hemisphere has much larger seasonal changes than uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, what processes cause the change of the global mean atmospheric CO2 concentration? To answer this question, we need to first take a look um, at the global carbon cycle. Um, so this diagram shows oral land, uh, vegetation uh, exchange of carbon dioxide with the atmosphere through uh, photosynthesis, respiration, and, and also fire. Uh, depending on whether the photosynthesis is higher or lower than respiration uh, or, and fire, this process could cause either increase or decrease of atmospheric CO2 concentration. So anthropogenic emissions, including um, uh, fossil fuel and land use changes, release carbon into the atmosphere, always causing an increase in the atmospheric CO2 concentration. Uh, well, over the ocean, the air CO2 exchange process include uh, both the biogenic process and also the physical CO2 exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean due to partial CO2 uh, pressure differences. So this process could cause this all all this process could cause like CO2 uh, either increase or decrease some of it together. Um, the change of the global mean atmospheric CO2 concentration at any time is the uh, integration of all these surface carbon fluxes during that time interval. For example, the annual global mean CO2 increase will be the integral of all the surface carbon fluxes over a year. So the steady increase of atmospheric CO2 concentration we saw in the previous slide uh, indicate the integration of all these surface carbon fluxes is positive. So that caused the increase of atmospheric CO2 concentration increase with time. Um, well, the change of the global mean atmospheric CO2 concentration is the integration of all surface carbon fluxes. The temporal change of local and regional CO2 concentration is not only related to um, surface carbon fluxes, but also the lateral transport, as I show here, like this arrows. So the so-called background values. So for example, the change of atmospheric CO2 concentration over your region or your city is not only related to your local carbon fluxes, but also the CO2 concentration transported um, to your region from other area. So the air with lower CO2 concentration transported to air, your area will cause decrease of CO2 concentration and vice versa. So in part three, you will learn how to account for background values um, and extract local fluxes using uh, OCO3 observation. So as I show in this equation, that regional uh, change of CO2 concentration is not only related to uh, the surface fluxes, but also related to the lateral transport and the background value. So um, this slide shows uh, three examples of CO2 concentration time series observed by OCO2 at three uh, different locations. Uh, this first point um, is uh, in uh, East Asia, and the second point is in uh, North America, and the third point is in uh, Southern Hemisphere, like uh, ocean. So no matter where they are, like the three points are in uh, very different locations, the atmospheric CO2 concentration show a similar like increasing trend, even though they have uh, different seasonal changes. Um, this annual increase about like 2.5 parts per million is not only due to local surface carbon fluxes, but also the lateral transport of background values. So for example, like the um, 2.5 parts per million increase over the Southern Ocean is not because the ocean carbon flux at that point is a big source. 
but because of the increase of the atmospheric CO2 concentration in the background that transported to that point. So uh, with this three plus, I really want to emphasize the importance of counting for background CO2 values when uh, interpreting the changes of atmospheric CO2 concentration and any location. So when you plot the CO2 concentration from OCO2 observation at your location, uh, the increase of the CO2 is really not only due to fluxes of your local city or local area. Uh, so in the last few slides, um, we talk about concentration and fluxes. So on this slide, I will um, summarize definitions of carbon fluxes, concentration, and also the commonly used units uh, for both. So atmospheric CO2 is normally expressed as a parts per million by volume, abbreviated as a PPMV. We normally call it as PPM. So when PPM uh, represent one particle of CO2 molecule per one million particles of dry air molecules. So this has to uh, pay attention that here is dry air molecules, which does not include uh, water vapor. And carbon fluxes um, represents direction and rate of transfer of carbon between between um, Earth's carbon pools, like such as the atmosphere, ocean, and the land. Um, the units of carbon fluxes that we normally use is gram carbon per square meter per day, so it's per area, per time. Um, other units, like when for the annual uh, carbon fluxes, we use gigaton carbon per year, uh, which is equal to like gram carbon per meter uh, per square meter per day times the number of days per year times the area, and the unit conversion is one ten to minus uh, fifteen. And the other unit is teragrams carbon per year. So the difference is like the conversion uh, unit is a little bit different. And the pentagram, we also use pentagram, which is the same as uh, same amount of as the gigaton uh, carbon per year. Uh, so then um, what's the connection like between carbon fluxes and for CO2 concentration? Like how to convert the carbon flux unit uh, to a concentration unit? And so we first need to convert flux to mass uh, unit and then to volume unit. Um, so the, the ratio between the number of CO2 molecules and number of dry air molecules uh, is equal to uh, carbon flux times the area. So then uh, times duration, this way convert the carbon fluxes to mass here, and then divided by 12, uh, this is number of carbon molecules, and then divided by number of dry air molecules, this converted to parts per parts. And then we further multiply by uh, E1 uh, to the uh, 10 to the power of six, this is really converted to parts per million. Um, so in the this in this conversion, one parts per million is approximately about two point one four gigaton carbon uh, per year. Um, so like we talk about surface carbon flux in the concentration, but how are the surface carbon flux linked with um, the atmospheric CO2 concentration? It's really through uh, the wind's atmospheric transport. An atmospheric transport model simulates how the real atmosphere links surface carbon fluxes with atmospheric CO2 concentration. So in this diagram, I illustrate how the, uh, the atmospheric transport models link the surface carbon fluxes with the concentration field. So in the forward run, we prescribe surface carbon fluxes that include uh, fossil fuel emission, uh, the land carbon fluxes, and the ocean carbon fluxes. Um, with the winds and atmospheric transport model, the CO2 release at the surface is transported throughout the globe. The simulated concentration is continuous in both space and time, as demonstrated in this uh, the, the two plus at the bottom. 
Um, these are the two examples of simulated column CO2 concentration. So one is in the spring, one in the, in the summer. Um, the warmer colors represent higher CO2 concentration, while cooler colors represent lower CO2 concentration. So the spring um, has higher CO2 concentration over uh, the northern hemisphere. Um, since the surface carbon fluxes in the spring are dominated by fossil fuel emissions and respiration from ecosystem, so that all increase the atmospheric CO2 concentration. Well, in the summertime, especially in the northern hemisphere, the atmospheric CO2 concentration is much lower because the carbon uptake by photosynthesis process outpaces the uh, carbon release from ecosystem respiration and the fossil fuel emissions. So through this process, the atmospheric trans model um, link the surface carbon fluxes with the atmos atmospheric CO2 concentration. So on this slide, you will see animation. I will play the animation of a simulated atmospheric CO2 column by an atmospheric transport model. So you clearly see that uh, the there is uh, like a very uh, active weather systems and change of CO2 concentration with time. So on top of the um, this CO2 simulation by the atmospheric trust model are the CO2 are the OCO2 overpass tracks. So I will play again. You will see like the big flash. That's really those uh, the 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 stripes are the OCO2 orbital uh, tracks. But you can see that that the OCO2 only captures a snapshot of atmospheric CO2 concentration. This animation again demonstrates that the change of atmospheric CO2 concentration is due to both the atm atmospheric transport and also the surface carbon fluxes. So the surface carbon fluxes cannot be easily observed, um, but we thought what we can observe is uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration. Then how do we derive fluxes from atmospheric CO2 concentration? Um, the process to calculate carbon fluxes with atmospheric CO2 concentration is called atmospheric CO2 flux inversion. So I will uh, show how this process works. So I showed this plot before. Through the forward atmospheric transport model, we can simulate the spatial temporal distributions of atmospheric CO2 concentration corresponding to uh, the prescribed surface carbon fluxes. So this is the spatial temporal distribution of the uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration, and there is overpasses of OCO2 observation. And then we compare the simulated CO2 concentration with the observation. If the simulated concentration are different from uh, the observed, uh, that means that the prescribed surface carbon flux is, is not consistent with the observation. Then we uh, adjust the surface carbon fluxes to minimize the differences between um, the optimized fluxes and the prior indicated as XB, and then the observation and the simulated concentration in the second term are like represented by the uh, red colors. And each term is normalized by their uh, error covariance term. So through this process, we adjust the surface carbon fluxes to minimize the difference between the simulated concentration and the observation. In the end, we obtain a posterior fluxes that best match the uh, observation. So then the surface, carb surface carbon flux will be consistent with the observation. So this process is called the atmospheric CO2 flux inversion. So this shows an example of the prior, uh, posterior, night bounce exchange and their uh, differences. The posterior NBE, the net bounce exchange, is the optimized surface carbon fluxes that best match the observation. Uh, the NBE includes all land carbon fluxes except fossil fuel emission. The so positive values indicate the carbon source uh, to the atmosphere, and uh, um, uh, negative values indicate land carbon sink. The difference between posterior and prior indicates 
that the posterior fluxes have much larger source over uh, northern Africa, weaker uptake over southern hemisphere, middle latitudes, and the weaker source over the northern hemisphere. So through this uh, inversion process, we adjust the prior fluxes that best mass observation at the same time, we adjust the way the posterior fluxes has been, um, is different from the prior. So in the next uh, three slides, uh, we'll look at some features of surface carbon fluxes and the links with the characteristics of atmospheric CO2 concentration. The top two panels show um, net basic change MBE in March um, and July. Uh, it shows stronger seasonal cycle over the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere which corresponds to the much larger seasonal uh, changes in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere we showed on the, uh, on the second slide. And the magnitude of ocean carbon fluxes at the bottom two panels is an order of magnitude smaller um, than the land carbon fluxes. You will all learn how to make the, this plus with Jupyter notebooks later on. And these two plots show uh, fossil fuel emissions in the same month, the same two months, like March 2016 and July 2016. So most of the fossil emissions concentrate over East Asia, Europe, and North America. And fossil fuel emissions, I mean, you show have much uh, weaker seasonal changes than the night basic change over land. And the relative magnitude of night basic change MBE and the fossil fuel emissions uh, depends on the location. Um, here on the left panel is the biosphere flux in the ocean and fossil fuel emissions at one point in China, which shows that the magnitude of fossil fuel emission is much larger than the uh, biosphere fluxes shown in the green uh, line. Well, on the right a panel is one point in Africa, the fossil emission in at this point is almost zero. Integrating on um, the carbon fluxes uh, of each category, like land flux, ocean flux, or fossil fuel over a year, over the globe, we can get yearly carbon fluxes in gigaton carbon per year. In this plot, it shows yearly uh, carbon fluxes from land, biosphere, ocean, fossil fuel. A total is a sum of land, ocean, and fossil fuel, and also the NOAA observed increase of atmospheric carbon each year. The negative numbers uh, indicate carbon sink, positive numbers indicate carbon source from 2015 to 2012. Uh, 2012, 2022, both land biosphere and ocean act as carbon sink, um, with land carbon fluxes having a very large year-to-year -year variability is much larger than the ocean year-to-year -year variability. And the total um, represents the amount of carbon remained in the atmosphere based on the top-down flux inversion, so the sum of the fossil emission and the carbon sink over land and ocean. Um, this total carbon flux inferred from top down is consistent with the observed NOAA uh, carbon atmospheric CO2 increase. So the consistency between these two numbers is kind of a quality check on the top down CO2 flux inversion results. And removing the climatological uh, mean carbon fluxes from each year, we can get anomalies of annual carbon fluxes. So this plot shows uh, annual carbon flux anomalies over land, tropical land, ocean, fossil fuel, total, and uh, the observed NOAA CO2 growth rate anomalies. Um, it shows the land uh, carbon fluxes have much larger year-to-year -year variability dominated by uh, the variability over uh, tropical land. So they almost have the same amount of anomaly uh, every year. For example, in 2015 and 2016, the observed um, NOAA CO2 increase shows about one uh, gigaton carbon mole uh, CO2 remained in the atmosphere compared to the climatological mean 
this one uh, more gigaton carbon remained in the atmosphere almost completely comes from the reduced net land carbon uptake, like uh, represented this one gigaton, gigaton carbon anomaly. Um, and the tropical land carbon flux anomaly over these two years is also about one gigaton, which implies that tropical uh, land carbon flux anomaly dominates the total land carbon flux anomaly in these two years. And the last slide showed that um, 2015 to 2016 had the largest atmospheric CO2 growth in these eight uh, years, dominated by reduced net land carbon uptake over tropics. In the next few slides, I will talk about what happened in 2015 and 2016 and how to interpret the, uh, the drought signals shown in both CO2 concentration and the surface carbon fluxes. 2015-2016 had um, the strongest El Nino event during the OCO2 record. So the left panel shows the composite precipitation anomalies during El, El Nino years. It shows reduced uh, precipitation over tropical land, especially over tropical South America and tropical Asia. While the right two panels shows uh, the annual mean precipitation anomalies uh, in 2015, and also the precipitation anomaly uh, during October to December 2015, it shows in 2015, the precipitation has been greatly reduced over tropical region, especially over, um, uh, especially during the uh, second half of the year. So let's first take a look at the concentration signals. The top panel shows the differences of atmospheric CO2 between March 2016 and March 2015. So it's basically it's the March 2016 CO2 concentration observed by CO2 minus March, March um, uh, 2015 values. So it shows the annual atmospheric CO2 increase from March 2015 to March 2016, it shows more than um, four parts per million increase over tropical South America and more than three parts per million increase in tropical Africa and Asia. So on um, like normal years, the atmospheric CO2 increase is about 2.5 parts per million as we show early on. This indicates that OCO2 observed much higher CO2 increase uh, from 2015 to 2016, corresponding to this El Nino and the drought over uh, the tropical region. Then what's the impact of this El Nino on carbon fluxes? So the bottom uh, left panel shows the integrated uh, net biospheric change from April to March, April 2015 to March 2016, with positive numbers uh, indicating carbon source and negative numbers indicating uh, carbon sink, it shows that tropical land becomes um, a carbon source due to the impact of the El Nino, contributing to the large increase of atmospheric CO2 concentration shown uh, in the top panel. So as we talked earlier, um, that the change of atmospheric CO2 concentration is a function of both the surface carbon fluxes and lateral transport. So the more than uh, four parts per million increase is uh, from both the, the transport of fossil fuel emissions um, signal to the tropics and the anomalous carbon source from the impact of the El Nino. So as shown in the red panel, is a total carbon fluxes between the April 2015 to March 2016 that includes both fossil emission and uh, the natural carbon fluxes. So that has big carbon source over uh, China, Europe, and, uh, and US dominated by the fossil emission. So that in indicates that this large carbon release over the North Hemisphere has been transported over tropics that contribute to this more than four parts per million increase over the region. So this more than four parts per million increase is not only from the local carbon fluxes, but also from the transport from uh, other regions. 
with the ending um, of the uh, El Nino in 2016, the, atm the atmospheric CO2 increase over the tropics becomes much smaller. So the top panel shows the CO2 difference between March 2017 and the March 2016. It shows the atmospheric CO2 increase is about uh, two parts per million over most of the tropics, and while well, some regions even have less than two parts per million increase. And the integrated land carbon flux over tropics between um, April 2016 to March 2017 becomes a carbon sink over most of the region that's represented by this uh, 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 green blue color. Um, again, the regional CO2 increase is a function of both atom atmospheric CO2 transport and the local carbon fluxes. So the about like two parts per million increase over the tropics is not only due to the net carbon sink, but also due to the lateral transport that trans uh, that um, bring the higher CO2 concentration to this uh, region. So the atmospheric CO2 increase would be negative if it were only due to the local carbon fluxes because uh, over the tropics over this year is a net carbon sink. Um, so this slide summarizes the drought signals we observe with OCO2 and the inferred carbon fluxes. So during the drought, this as we showed earlier, during the drought, the atmospheric CO2 increase is much higher, shown in the top panel, while the atmospheric CO2 increase becomes uh, smaller after drought, shown in the second panel. Um, the drought dramatically uh, decreased the net carbon sink, shown in the, um, the bottom left panel, represented by the uh, positive numbers. So 2015-2016 El Nino has the largest impact over tropical land, and the impact over the ocean um, is much smaller. Uh, the, 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 as shown in the bottom right panel, that is the total flux difference between uh, 2015 uh, to 20, integrated value between 2015 and 2016, and the integral value between 2016 and 2017. So the ocean flux change is really small. So above, you know, through these slides, above we show that um, we can, the OCO2 uh, can detect the impact of the drought and uh, through the flux inversion, we could estimate the change of surface carbon fluxes due to the impact of climate anomalies such as El Nino. So in summary, uh, we have talked about how to interpret the uh, column CO2 concentration observed by OCO2, the global carbon cycle processes, the link between uh, surface carbon fluxes and uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration, the units for uh, both the carbon fluxes and the concentration, and the conversions between the two. We also talk about um, the atmospheric CO2 flux inversion process and how to interpret the surface carbon fluxes and the prior and posterior fluxes uh, used in the flux inversion. And at last, we talk about um, how to interpret the impact of El Nino on atmospheric CO2 concentration and the surface carbon fluxes. So uh, in the end, there are a few uh, references I'll list here. I would uh, highly encourage you to read uh, after the training. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Karen Ewan, and I am going to do the first portion to help you get started with OCO data. Before we get started with the Python notebook demonstration that they do for you, I would like to remind everyone the availability timeline for both the OCO2 and OCO3 products. OCO2 was launched in 2014, therefore we have a decade's worth of data. And OCO3 was launched in 2019, and we have five years worth of data. Both missions products are archived and distributed at the Goddard Earth Science Data and Information Service Center, or just DISC. If you do not have a profile, please register for free. The data are freely available, but you must register to download the files and use certain tools. Once you are on the Justice site, simply search for OCO2 and or OCO3. And you will see the picture there to give you an example. The search 
We'll pull up all available data products based on your search criteria. If you recall from our beginner training, you will find the same details such as the naming convention and information. However, newer features such as the updated versions of the data product and the ability to work in the cloud um, as shown with the arrow here and a reminder for the naming convention. Please refer to the beginner training if you in depth of how to navigate through uh, the, the file formats. Since the mission data are freely available and in support of NASA's ongoing policy on open science, please cite the use of the data in your publications and other information platforms. I have included the language as well as the DOI on the slide here. Before David will do the Python notebook demonstration, you will need to download some software packages for this portion of the training. He will go into further detail as well. We will be working in Python 3, and Python and Jupyter Notebooks are packaged within Conda. Please, in, please follow the install in, uh, directions listed for your respective operating systems, and we do have a link here to guide you. The libraries that you will need to use and import in the code below should be included in Conda. Please remember um, which directory you download your files in, and we will recommend creating a folder for the data. And for the next step, the libraries in each, um, as I said, should be installed in Conda. Here's a screen grab of um, if you need to check to type in Conda list in your terminal. And it should pull up all the libraries that are currently there. If you, uh, when you scroll and you don't see what you need, just all you need to do is a pip install. And here's another screen grab for you to just um, put in what you need. As you can see, you can put in multiple libraries from there. Um, but we are going to make sure you create an environment for you to work for these notebooks. And David will go to that part of the demonstration. And to open a Jupyter Notebook, same thing. If you open a terminal prompt, you type in Jupyter Notebook and you will be ready to go. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Karen. My name is David Moroni. It's good to be here with you all. Uh, this is actually my first time doing an RSET training. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, where I'm gonna start things off is our GitHub repository uh, that has been uh, set up for us uh, specifically just for this particular training exercise here. And so, um, we're going to walk through this and then just to remind folks how to get here is in your homework assignment uh, for your RSET training. Uh, you should have received uh, this link to this GitHub repo um, in your as part of your uh, training packet uh, for your homework assignment. So that's how you get here, but you should all be also be able to see the URL at the top of my screen here. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. And uh, so from here, uh, I just wanted to point out that the starting point that I'd like to call attention to is this environment.yaml file. Um, and you can actually see instructions on what you need to do here uh, to uh, get that environment.yml file um, set up uh, with your Conda dependencies. And so what this actually does is that it installs uh, your, uh, your Conda and your PIP dependencies. So in your homework assignment, you should have also seen instructions on how to in install uh, the Anaconda package. You, you can see this once again called out here um, in this, um, this readme file here. And so uh, what this environment.yml file looks like, uh, you can get to it here uh, when you click on it from the GitHub site, which is what I'm doing right now. Uh, there's some comments at the top that tell you how to install it from your command line. So this would be the install command. Uh, and so for the sake of time, we're not gonna do that in real time today. I'm just gonna point you to the command and how to install it. And that's captured right here in this um, environment.yml file at the, the top header uh, where the comments are. And then once it's installed, uh, that should take maybe 15, 20 minutes or so to install everything. Once that's installed, you're gonna go ahead and activate it with this command, just like so. And then once you're finished with everything, you wanna go back to your normal environment, you're gonna do conda deactivate. And this is all gonna be done from your, uh, your terminal. Uh, I'm running everything on a MacBook right now. So your terminal, if you're on a MacBook, will look something like this window, uh, which I'm having in the background. Um, and that's where you'll uh, execute that and run that. So what I'm going to go ahead and do first and foremost is I'm going to 
go back here and, and orient folks to uh, where the notebooks are um, at this juncture. So we have uh, two notebooks. This is the OCO2 uh, test notebook uh, for doing download and plotting. And then we also have this Flux notebook here as well, which we'll see in a moment um, uh, as, as, uh, the, as we conclude the part two demonstration and tutorial. And so uh, you can either download these individually uh, or what we'll, what we'll do now for the sake of time, I'll walk you through how do you actually download these in bulk, uh, including the environment.yaml file. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is type this command uh, in my uh, terminal that I've already uh, preloaded here, git clone, and then you just type in the HTTPS URL uh, to the GitHub repo. So I'm gonna do that right now. And in real time, it will clone and download uh, with everything that's in the repo at the present time. So it's already gone ahead and done that. And I've got a separate window here which contains the, the, the folder of uh, what I've just downloaded, uh, this, re this repo that I've just cloned. And so from here, you can verify and we can quickly see that we have all of the notebooks and the environment.yaml file, the license file, the readme file has all been downloaded uh, to that directory right there. And so uh, with that, uh, we should be good to go. I'm just gonna do an LS in the terminal to verify. Yes, in fact, we see it. I'm gonna change directories now in my terminal to that new clone directory there, do an LS one more time see what we have in front of us. And so uh, this is gonna be the very first notebook that we're going to load. But before we do that, we have to uh, activate our Conda environment. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is the command to do that. So we're gonna uh, copy that command right there from the environment.yaml file. And we're going to insert that directly into our terminal shell window, hit the return key. And now, as you can see, we uh, have this con environment. This tells us which environment we're in, the OCO RSET ENB environment. So that's the correct environment. Now we're gonna go ahead and launch our Jupyter Notebook, or at least our first one for the day. So the way we do that is we type in the command Jupyter with a Y notebook, and then we paste in the name of the notebook itself. And we're going to let it do its thing. It's going to launch into the web browser. And you should all be able to see that right here. So at this stage, uh, I'm going to turn off my camera. Or it looks like it's already turned off. Never mind. Um, well, I'll, I'll turn it on once more just so folks can see who I am. I, I don't know if it was on before, but hello once again. At this stage, uh, we're going to now transition into the first uh, notebook walkthrough here. Uh, so thank you for your patience as we transition to this portion. Okay, so just some high level context. So uh, following Junji's pre presentation that was just concluded, uh, we're gonna walk through a set of Python notebooks that we will, uh, that will recreate the imagery presented by Junji, starting with the OCO2 El Nino analysis, which is what we have in front of us. And then we'll conclude with our, uh, our second and last notebook for part two, which is the global carbon flux analysis. So in this first Python notebook, we will walk through the steps of querying NASA Earth Data Common Repository API, also known hereafter as CMR. Uh, and this will be for the OCO2 level two bias corrected XCO2 data. From here, we will download the data files within our prescribed time period of study of the 2015 to 2016 El Nino, selecting prescribed variables, applying a quality flag filter, interpreting the data to a common grid, generating monthly averages, computing differences between monthly averages, plotting the results on a lat-long rectangular map, and then lastly, exp exporting the plots as PNG files to a local directory. The plots generated in this notebook are intended to replicate the OCO2 El Nino plots shown in the previous presentation by Junji. While this notebook does make use of a .NET RC file for NASA Earth Data Login credentials, with the instructions provided in the top cell right here in this notebook, a .NET RC file is not required as the notebook provides dynamic generation of the .NET RC file with your supplied credentials. What we do require in advance is for you to verify or create if needed your personal Earth Data login, which is explained right here in step one. Once your Earth Data login account is verified and functional, you'll then proceed to step two which ensures that the CMR API recognizes your credentialed access permissions for the NASA JESDISC archive. The NASA JESDISC is the only DAC archive we will use uh, for this notebook training module. Step three captures how to create your .NET RC file with your login credentials. 
But as I mentioned previously, this is not required. You'll see in this set of other important notes uh, with the most important step being to ensure you trust this notebook before executing, which you can check by seeing the trusted icon at the top right of your notebook display, as you can see right here. If it says not trusted, then you should be able to directly click right here and adjust it to trusted. This will prevent errors when writing output to your local directory. I'll also take this time to point out that this notebook is only meant for initial training and demonstration of the utility of these data sets in support of OCO2 and OCO3 and in support of the R set training associated with this. And the link is supplied here with more details on that. Before proceeding into the notebook workflow, I would like to now acknowledge that the direct contributions from Karen Yuan and uh, Dr. Junji Liu from the OC2 project at JPL, uh, who had presented the slide deck material laying out the background for this notebook training just before uh, this portion. I also want to mention real quick that this notebook is also designed to function as is for the scope of the training exercise. As code dependencies and data sources periodically become deprecated or updated, the users of these notebooks bear the responsibility to maintain and or repurpose these notebooks and associated dependencies in a workable state beyond the scope of this initial training. The last acknowledgement I would like to say at this point is that uh, there have been some passive contributions to acknowledge um, incorporated via open source code that has been made available through the NASA JPL Trocas project, NASA OpenScapes, the National Snow and Ice Data Center, also known as NSIDC, and lastly, by NASA's JESDISC. All right, so now we transition into running our first cell. And so now we will press the run button to execute through all Python code cells, starting with the first cell that loads our Python dependencies containing libraries and modules, most of which are made accessible through our established Conda environment. Through the rest of this notebook, as well as upcoming, as well as the upcoming notebook, you'll see these encoded time functions demarcated by double percent symbols. As you can see right here. Uh, and these are used uh, in prescribed cells that require a varying level of compute memory allocation and or IO. This, pr this prints what is referred to as wall time in addition, in addition to the CPU times broken down by the user and system. What most of us here probably care most about is the wall time, which is essentially the real world elapsed time from the start to finish of cell execution. So in this walkthrough, I'm executing this again, once again, on my personal MacBook laptop. And also to point out, this is on my home network. So the wall time performance will vary according to the platform type, CPU and memory architecture, and the networking that is used to execute this notebook. Now, as we run through cell number two, we will attempt to authenticate with CMR using the Earth Data Access Library, or the Earth, I should say the Earth Access Library. If a, if a .NETRC file is not provided in advance, you will see this prompt that you see here requesting your login credentials. And as I insert them here in just one moment, uh, I'll press the return key right after each step. And then at that point, it will create the .NETRC file that has, a, that has validated those credentials. So as I now enter them in, You can see authentication valid equals true. It has authenticated those credentials and the .NRC file is now there and persistent. And that will also be used for our next notebook. So we won't have to recreate that. We are now on cell three, which, will, which we will now execute to first check if we have the appropriate local output directory for storing data. If not, it will automatically create this directory as it has uh, just done. This takes us to cell four, which is defining a response function to the CMR API. We will execute this cell, which will enable us uh, to use this function later. Now on cell five, starting with the reference URL uh, to the CMR API, we invoke our previously defined response function that can now verify that CMR is accessible with the status code 200. If for some reason we get a different response status, it could indicate a temporary outage at CMR. 
since CMR is accessible, we can proceed. Now in cell six, we define our CMR search parameters, starting with the CMR search URL, followed by the DOI, which defines our targeted data collection. As a side note, you can also copy and paste this DOI into your web browser search engine. And then the, the DOI should then resolve and take you directly to the target dataset landing page at JESDISC. As we execute this cell, we, we see the request function extracts CMR metadata elements from the targeted data set, including the short name, long name, and version ID. These elements are printed below the cell to help us verify we are querying the correct data set. So at, th at this point, I'll pause for a moment to remind the viewers that the previous RSET training series for OCO2 included a tutorial of how to browse and individually download data files directly through the JESDISC website. For the sake of time, we, won't cover, we will not cover this, but you may reference that material separately. In cell seven, we are defining the NetCDF variable input parameters that we will be using, including the XCO2 quality flag, as well as the XCO2 measurement variable. Now in cell eight, we specify the input parameters to query for data granules corresponding to the first month of analysis, which in our case is March, 2016. In the CMR realm, a data granule is simply a metadata object that points us to a data file that we can access. As we now execute this cell, we invoke the Earth Access Library's data granules function to do the heavy lift of the CMR query. It then prints the total matching granules for this month. You'll notice that a couple of granules are missing, and this is due to periodic data gaps in the OCOT record, which is actually quite normal when working with level two satellite remote sensing data. We also print a subset of the granule metadata to confirm that the query is returning a data file reference that matches our query. You'll also notice here that the, the first of these files corresponds to February 29th, which is a day before our March search period. And this is being given to us as the end date time in the observation record is at the precise zero Z time boundary of March 1st. In our upcoming analysis, we're gonna simply just ignore this data file. In cell nine, we execute uh, these try accept statements to download these data. The combination of these statements ensures that the data can be downloaded regardless of the computing infrastructure we are using, such as whether we are on-premise or in a cloud-based environment. We now see that all 29 files corresponding to the 29 granules in our previous CMR query are now being downloaded. This normally takes, I would say, about between 30 and 45 seconds. Once again, this is entirely dependent on your internet connection. In this case, it actually took much faster than that, uh, about tw just under 22 seconds. In cell 10, we set up our for loop that goes through the range of dates with our previously defined start and end date and times. As we now execute the cell, we see that it's then running through the data file path strings on our local directory to find matching files and iteratively reading through these data files. As each data file is read, we also extract the latitude, longitude measurement and quality flag variables into their own unique arrays. We then define the latitude and longitude max min, which sets our spatial bounding box for our plot. The latitude extent is confined to the plus and minus 30 degree range, which helps us to narrow our analysis over the tropics, as this is our primary focus for our El Nino study. From here, we also use NumPy to do a bounding box selection combined with a quality flag filter, which we then apply to complete the subsetting of our data arrays. You should note that by using the quality flag filter equals zero, we exclude what is considered to be the bad quality data. And so we also now set the pixel or grid point size to a five by five degree resolution. Then we generate a new consistent lat long grid that will be used for an interpolated grid map. Now we do a nearest neighbor binning to find the closest matching OCO2 observations that matches our recently created five by five degree grid. These results then are appended to the time series variable as the loop continues to iterate through the remaining files for this month. The last step in this cell utilizes NumPy to, comp to compute the monthly mean of the time series and create a new array of graded data featuring the monthly mean values. Now below this cell, we see the printed results, including each file that is read in, the time series array dimensions, and the time it took to execute. Now in cell 11, 
we generate our first map plot of OCO2 column averaged CO2 using a combination of functions from the base map library and matplotlib. We then save this figure as a PNG file. And here's the plot. Now for these remaining cells, we're gonna repeat a lot of these steps over uh, for, for a new set of data to generate new plots. And so now we're gonna do the same for Mar March of 2015. Now it's downloading the data for that month. Once again, this could take anywhere from 20 to 45 seconds or so, depending on your internet connection. Okay, there we go, about 21 seconds or so. Now we're gonna read those variables insert them into the arrays, generate our lat long map plot. And there it is for March 2015. Now we're going to compute the difference between March of 2016 and March of 2015. And now we're going to specify the March 2017 input parameters. We'll do the same set of plots for March 2017. Now we're downloading the files. Once again, this will take about 20 to 45 seconds or so. Okay, now we're going to read through the data files and store them into arrays and make a monthly average. We're going to generate that lat long map plot. And this is that plot for March 2017. Now we're going to compute the difference. And this difference is between March of 2017 and March of 2016. So in this final step, what we're going to do now is we're going to go through how to locate your image files that we had just generated. And so from this top drop down menu, we're going to click on view and then click on File Browser. And this actually opens up a new window, and this is opened up as a new window tab on my browser. And your browser might behave a little bit differently. I'm not sure if it'll open up a new tab or a new window, but it should open something up that resembles this. And what we now want to locate is the data directory, which is right here. We double click on that to load the data directory. And so from here, we can see all of the PNG files that we just generated. In addition to that, we see all of the NetCDF files that were downloaded for all of those analysis plots that we did. You should also be able to locate and access these same files in your system folders, which should be in the same location where you're running the, the Jupyter Notebooks from. If you would like, you may select specific files, and if you would like, you can copy those to different directory by checking off these boxes. So, for example, we have these boxes here. And uh, you can upload, if you click that upload button there, it creates a pop-up window that allows you to then select a folder that you'd like to copy those files into. You can also right-click the files that you've selected in these boxes, and this will allow you to delete, if you'd like, any files that you no longer wish to have in your directory. So now at this time, we will transition into the notebook that will demonstrate how to plot the carbon fluxes. All right, so at this point, we'll, we'll use this, uh, this browse tab that has just opened up where we verified our data files. At this point, we'll use this to go back to the top level directory and we can actually open up our carbon flux analysis notebook uh, right from here. As you can see, it's right here. So we're gonna double click on that. There it is. All right, so the first thing we will check is our Python environment, which we can confirm right here that it correctly says the, the right um, environment is being used, the right con environment, OCO, RSA, ENV. I should have probably mentioned this in the first notebook, so I'll mention it right now. 
Uh, if for some reason you don't see this, you can actually click that right there. And here's the drop down menu uh, where you can manually select it here as well. And uh, if, you've, if you're running this environment for the very first time, uh, you might even see an initial pop up window before you even see this. You might actually see this pop up first as your notebook is running for the very first time. And this will give you the opportunity to select the correct Conda environment, which I verified is already correctly selected. So in this notebook, we will walk through the steps of querying the NASA CMR API for the following CMS Flux datasets, all of which are graded level four products. The NBE dataset provides the estimated net biosphere exchange fluxes. The ocean dataset provides the estimated air sea carbon fluxes over the global oceans. And the last data set we'll utilize here is the fossil fuel prior, which provides the estimated carbon flux produced by fossil fuel emissions. More information on these data sets can be found in the respective data set landing pages maintained by the NASA Jazz Disk, which you may, you may find by clicking on any of these respective links that are next to these uh, data set entries. Consistent with what was previously presented by Junji, we will now go through this entire notebook and generate a series of scientific flux plots, starting with lat long maps over the various months of interest, followed by the annualized flux plots, total net carbon flux plots, bar chart comparisons of the annualized totals, and a final bar chart comparison of the year by year flux anomalies. For the map plots, we will use this notebook to focus first on the months of March and July of the year 2016, which is used to help depict the seasonal differences in the fluxes. We then conclude our map plots with annualized totals that are computed in two adjacent years from March 2015 to March 2016. And from 20 and sorry, and from April 2016 to March 2017. It's in selecting these two different years side by side that we can see some of the impacts El Nino has in these fluxes that are in conjunction with the fossil fuel emissions. As we conclude with the bar charts, we provide an annualized flux comparison utilizing a longer time series going from 2015 through 2022. All of the other important notes, user guidance and acknowledgements are the same as represented in the first notebook. So now we will press run to execute our first cell. And so we will start with loading first our Python dependencies containing libraries and modules, most of which were made accessible through our already activated Conda environment. For the sake of time, we'll directly execute the next series of cells, but we won't explain them again, as these were already explained in the previous notebook. The key differences to pay attention to are coming up later in cells six and seven. And now starting with cell six, uh, where we define the input parameters, and these are unique to our initial NBE data set that we will then query and extract data files from. Now we query the data set in CMR, and then we execute our query for the matching granules. Now in cell nine, uh, we see that we downloaded only one data file for the NBE flux data set. It's downloading right now, it takes about just under four seconds, which is, uh, this is downloaded because uh, each of the Flux data files are aggregated for the full time series. So we only really need one file per Flux data set. The same will be true later uh, when we download the files for the ocean and the fossil fuel data sets. All right, so as we read in, going into the next cell, as we read in the, the NBE Flux data variables, we also utilize the time and area variables. The time variable is used to create a separate array that allows us to uh, later query the data arrays using specific month and year search parameters. This is achieved through a couple of steps uh, featuring uh, this NumPy array function right here. And let's see, where am I at? All right. So this, so that was the NumPy array function, and then that converts the time data into a queryable year month format, followed by a Num, NumPy AS type function, which converts our newly constructed data set
and this converts it into a newly constructed time array uh, into a more queryable 1D string array. In conjunction with the reshape function I should have mentioned, yeah. Okay, so that I believe has already been executed. I'm just gonna double check and make sure I, I will re-execute. There we go. All right, so I should also mention uh, in this cell here that the uh, the area reshape function takes our area array and shapes it into a 3D array that allows for mathematical functions to be more consistently applied with our data arrays. And then this last step in the cell is to expand our latitude range to account for all data across across the globe, this last step here. Cell 11 now produces our first plot featuring NBE flux data for March 2016. You will also notice here that our, that there are both positive and negative fluxes as we execute. The negative fluxes are captured by the blue gradient while the positive fluxes are in the red gradient. The near zero fluxes are shaded in white. The units for the NB fluxes, uh, as well as subsequent monthly flux plots that you, you see on a monthly cadence are in units of grams per carbon per square meter per day. Now going on to cell 12, this cell produces our next plot capturing the NB flux data for July, 2016. The biggest difference you see in July is the stark contrast, actually the stark reversal uh, to negative fluxes uh, for the Northern Hemisphere and more positive fluxes in, in Southern Africa and South America. So we're now gonna utilize cell 13 to compute the NBE flux difference between July and March of 2016. And we can now see the difference plotted right there. Now going on to cell 14, we prep for new arrays to store the number of days for each month. Actually, this says cell, cell 15 by accident. This is originally cell 14. Sorry for that, that issue there, as I regenerated the cells uh, a second ago. And so these are arrays that are storing the number of days in each month, accounting for both leap and non-leap years. These arrays will be used later to compute the annualized flux estimates. Now in cell 15, we prepare the data to generate the annualized NBE fluxes from April 2015 to March 2016. We use NumPy to create both a selection start and selection end in our month year date selection. And then we assign this to a start and end index. The ending index is adjusted to plus one to ensure we have a full 12 month period of coverage from April to March. So as I have just ran that cell, which created the plot, uh, I just wanna also mention that we, in this series of cells, we also create a new NBE measurement array that covers the, the selected start and end date indices. And then we allocate another new NBE array that will store our adjusted total fluxes, which are adjusted for area and days per month. Also, we have this for loop that we iterate through each month and compute the adjusted total fluxes by multiplying by area and the number of days corresponding to each month. It's important here in this step to make sure that we are precisely computing for the correct number of days for the given month, as we can otherwise introduce an error uh, that while small each for each month can add up to become a significant uh, error once it becomes annualized. So once again, the number of days for each month is defined in the previous cell above. And then also in this cell, we use uh, NumPy uh, to, to compute the 12 month total of adjusted fluxes into a new array that contains the total annualized fluxes that have that is then reshaped into a, as a 2D array that can be plotted on a lat long map that we see here. And the rest of uh, what we see in the plotting steps is virtually identical to what we've seen previously with some subtle adjustments to the title color bar and units. The units of the total annualized fluxes in this case here is now teragrams per year. Moving on down, now to, in cell 16, we repeat what we did in the previous cell, but adjusted for, 20, for April 2016 to March 2017. And now we have this new plot. 
And here we see less annualized totals compared to the previous year and more negative flux totals overall, especially over the tropics. Now in cell 17, we transition into using ocean flux data. And so we will replicate a lot of the previous steps that we did uh, before. Uh, so we don't need to go into further detail on these, uh, just some minor adjustments to be specific to the ocean flux data set that we are working with. And so now we'll execute these upcoming cells that take, it'll take us now to our first ocean flux plot in just a moment for March 2016. Now we're downloading the data file, reading the data, and now we're going to complete the plotting step. And there we are. All right, so now we have um, our uh, ocean flux plot, our air-sea fluxes uh, for carbon uh, for March of 2016. And so here we fine tune the color bar to account for the reduced dynamic range of ocean flux relative to what was previously observed for the NBE flux. And in the next cell, we'll do the same for July 2016. And in July 2016, as you can see the plot here, uh, we see a different global ocean flux pattern emerge. Uh, compared to what we saw just above in March. Once we compute the difference between July and March in the next cell, we can see the stark contrast with July producing more positive fluxes in the northern mid-latitudes and more negative in the southern hemisphere tropics. Now in cell 25, we transition into the annualized flux computations and plots. Executing this cell reveals the total annualized flux in teragrams of carbon fluxes over the global oceans from April 2015 to March 2016. And there's that plot. And the following cell does the same for April 2016 to March 2017. And here in this plot, we see a more defined pattern of positive fluxes emerging over the intertropical convergence zone, also known as the ITCZ. Now in cell 27, we transition into using the fossil emission data. And so we will replicate a lot of the previous steps that we don't need to go into further detail on uh, with some minor adjustments to be specific to the fossil emission data set we are working with. Now we will execute these upcoming cells. It takes us to cell 32 once we download this data file give it a, there we go now we'll read in the data there it is and so this will give us our first uh fossil emission plot for march 2016. all right so now this is the uh, first fossil fuel flux plot for march 2016. Here we've completely changed the color palette uh, to more clearly see the dynamic range in fossil fuel emissions, which unlike the previous flux types only produces positive values. And so we've tailored this scale on the color bar accordingly. And in the next cell, we do the same for July 2016. And here we see a very similar flux pattern with some localized differences. Now on cell 34, we compute the difference between July and March. Like so. And again, this is the difference between July 2016 and March 2016. And so we, we also see here are some mostly slight differences in the fossil emissions with certain areas showing higher differences and uh, other areas differing as much as plus or minus half a gram per square meter per day, which is quite noticeable in East Asia, Europe, and the Middle East region. Now, moving on to cell 35, we transition into the annualized flux computations and plots. Executing the cell, as we just did, reveals the annualized total of teragrams of fossil fuel carbon emissions uh, from April 2015 to March 2016. The following cell does the same for April 2016 to March 2017. 
which produces a very similar pattern of total flux carbon emissions with only slight localized variations compared to the previous year. Now in cell 37, we transition to computing and plotting the total net carbon fluxes, starting with the one year period covering April 2015 to March 2016. This computation is simply a sum of each of the previously computed annualized components for NBE, ocean, and fossil emission fluxes. And in the following cell, we do the same calculation for plotting for April 2016 to March 2017. And this competition uh, is simply, let's see here, we, we, we want to say here, sorry, let me scratch that. <laughs> I just wanted to say here, uh, compared to the previous year, uh, we see a similar total net carbon flux pattern in the Northern Hemisphere with a distinctly different pattern in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, mostly, uh, this is visible mostly in the, uh, most visibly apparent, I should say, in the tropics. And now moving to cell 39. We transition into computing the annualized total flux compare computations, which are based um, on the January to December calendar years, starting from tw uh, 2015 and continuing through 2022. The data that we had previously stored into memory are reread into new arrays that are indexed according to the start and end dates of each calendar year. Similar to what we did previously, we include a for loop um, and compute a new set of fluxes that are adjusted according to the area and days in each month for normal years. We then have a second for loop that does the same for leap years um, for 2016 and 2020 specifically. And these are those for loops. And what I should also mention here is that the flux totals are then uh, computed and stored into arrays um, specifically for NBE ocean and fossil emission fluxes. And following the component calculations, we compute the net total annualized carbon flux, taking into account all three flux components over the same range of years. Before moving to the next cell, we print the annualized total fluxes for each flux component, which gives us a precise way to assess these estimates before we actually plot them for comparison. So as you can see here, they're printed to the screen and we can take a quick look at the actual values for each year and just do a sanity check and make sure they look okay before we proceed forward and plotting them on a bar chart. Now in cell 40, we plot and compare the annualized total fluxes into a bar chart. After we run this cell, we see the bar chart displaying eight distinct years of data grouped and spread across the land based NBE fluxes, ocean fluxes and fossil emissions, and also, lastly, the total net carbon fluxes. And in the next cell, we compute the eight-year global mean fluxes covering the same period from 2015 to 2022. And this includes the land-based NBE fluxes, ocean fluxes, fossil emissions, and total net carbon fluxes. And, and this allows us to, in this next cell, once we have those means computed, we can then compute the anomalies. So now in cell 42, uh, using the previously computed eight year mean fluxes, we then use the eight year mean as the basis to compute the flux anomalies for each year from 2015 to 2022. As we run this last cell, we generate the final plot that is uh, featured in this training exercise that includes a bar chart that shows the anomalies for each year according to the land-based NBE fluxes, the ocean fluxes, fossil emissions, and total net carbon fluxes. In this last bar chart, the year 2022 specifically produces a pronounced negative anomaly that is explained by the, co the coinciding large negative land-based NBE flux anomaly, suggesting a higher than average land-based biosphere uptake of carbon for that particular year. So now, once again, to retrieve all the images that we generated um, by this notebook, I, I would please refer you to the previous steps um, that were provided at the end of the first notebook in the part two exercise that featured the OCO2 data. Uh, when that, that's basically the same set of steps that uh, we use to uh, get to these .png file images. So this concludes our Python notebook training for part two. Thank you for your time and attention to this training material. And we look forward to any feedback and questions that you may have during the Q&A portion. 
The next couple of slides are a summary of today's session as well as resources and contact information. And here's a summary of what was covered today, um, how to interpret column CO2 spatial and temporal distributions, what are the factors that contribute to the change in local and global atmospheric CO2 concentration, as well as the units of atmospheric CO2 concentrations as, and surface carbon fluxes. Um, we covered the links between surface carbon fluxes and atmospheric CO2 concentrations, and you learned about CO2 flux inversion processes to understand surface fluxes. Um, how to interpret spatial and temporal distributions of surface carbon fluxes, as well as drought signals in both OCO2, CO2 concentration, and inferred fluxes. In addition to that, uh, you saw a demo on how to generate um, a lot of the figures or most of the figures that you saw in today's presentation. For those wanting to learn a little more about OCO2 and OCO3 data, here's a list of excellent references that you can start with. If anyone has any further questions about the material that was presented today, please feel free to contact any of the instructors. The third and last session of this training will be next Tuesday, July 16th. It will be focused on analyzing CO2 measurements over a large urban area. So you'll learn about how to recognize the importance and challenges of measuring CO2 over metropolitan areas and the aspects of the important aspects of space-based CO2 measurements over urban areas. There'll be a demo using Jupyter Notebook, which will walk participants through accessing, subsetting, and downloading multi-year OCO3 SAM data. SAM is this acquisition mode over metropolitan areas and then visualizing the OCO3 SAM data over urban areas and performing um, an analysis. And that concludes our second session. A very special thank you to Dr. Junji Lu, to Karen Yuan, to David Moroni for the presentation and the demonstration. Uh, also, thank you to all the participants. We've been gathering your questions, and we will uh, begin the Q&A session shortly. So we'll be sharing the screen here um, in a few moments. And um, as mentioned, we've been gathering your questions. But if you have additional questions, just uh, type them away in the questions box, please. Um, so uh, let's uh, just start from the top down, and I will read the question, and a member of the OCO2, OCO3 team uh, will be answering your question. So uh, let's just start with question one. Could you explain the concept of integration and its significance in the CO2 formula, and also state what it means with regards to what it translates to in our natural language? for the sake of understanding. Um, so this is Junji. I will uh, take a step of this question and to see whether Vivian has something to add. Um, I'm sorry for the jargon here. So the integration is really just represents um, a sum of the surface carbon fluxes over a specific time period. So it's really just meaning sum all the fluxes um, over time. Vivian, do you have anything to add? I'm not sure Vivian is online, but um Erica, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I okay. forgot to mute myself. Uh, we'll ask for Vivian's input on the written part of this question. I mm -hmm. don't think she's online at the moment. Okay. So thank you very much. We'll um, move on to question number two. 
How can we just ignore water vapor when discussing concentrations and fluxes? Everything is respect with respect to dry air, but any column of atmosphere has some level of moisture. Yeah, I think this question was also asked yesterday. Um, that you are right that the I mean the natural atmosphere has both has water vapor, but when we calculate column CO two concentration, we first first need to remove the mass of water vapor from the total air mass and then calculate the number of dry air molecules. The reason that we have to use dry air is because the total dry air mass in the atmosphere is constant with time because it doesn't change. I mean, the total, if you sum all together throughout the atmosphere, it doesn't change. But if you include the water vapor, it could change with time. So that could confuse us when we talk about CO2 changes. So that's why we have to use dry air instead of total air. Hopefully that addresses the question that has been really confusing for today and tomorrow and yesterday as well. Thank you for that. Question number three, could the variation of atmospheric concentration of CO2 during spring and summer in each hemisphere be possibly due to monsoonal activities? Um, that's for sure that monsoonal activities contribute to the seasonal variation of atmospheric CO2 concentration, but that's not all the story. So the variation of the CO2 concentration is due to uh, a lot of factors uh, besides the monsoonal activity. So the monsoonal activity affects the CO2 concentration basically through two ways. One is through the change of atmospheric transport pattern, because when you have monsoon, you could have the wind could change from the northward wind to the southward wind. So that will change where this uh, air comes from. So that change the CO2 concentration. The other is through the impact of the climate climate states on the surface carbon fluxes. So when you have a monsoonal system, like when in the, in the summer you have more rain and it's warmer, probably plants grow better. So then the plants ab absorb more carbon uh, from the atmosphere so that will change the atmospheric CO2 concentration. But vice versa, when you have the winter time, the plants go to dormant. So the respiration dominates that the CO2 concentration will increase, so that also affect the change of the CO2 concentration. Great. Question number four, what are the predictions of when the ocean carbon flux will stop being a significant sink? Um, this is a very um, good question. Um, so I put in the chat a reference to um, to further explain this. So what, when the uh, the ocean carbon flux will stop being a, sig a significant carbon sink, really depends on the um, the future fossil fuel emission scenarios. The reason that the 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 mechanism for the main mechanism for the uh, ocean to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere is through the partial CO2 differences between the atmosphere and uh, the ocean surface. I mean, the other is for, through biology. So when you have more fossil fuel emissions, that means the atmospheric CO2 concentration is keep increasing. And the, this, the gradient of the atmospheric CO2 and ocean CO2 is like positive means the atmosphere is higher than ocean CO2, then drive more CO2 into the ocean. So the ocean will keep remaining as a big carbon sink when you have higher CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. But when you have large reduction in the fossil fuel emissions, that leads to um, leads to reduction of atmospheric CO2 concentration, then the CO2 gradient will become smaller. Then the ocean will become less a carbon sink. So whether the CO2, whether the ocean will remain to be a big carbon sink really depends on the, uh, the future fossil fuel emission scenario. So there's really a feedback loop between the fossil fuel emissions and also the natural carbon cycle. You can check out the references later on that way uh, I have put it in the Google Doc. Okay, moving on to question number five. The Sahara Desert is devoid of vegetation for the most part and is less of a CO2 source from fossil fuels. Because of this, 
one would expect that this reflects on the simulation of atmospheric CO2, but it doesn't. And why is that? Um, that's really related to what we have um, presented and talked about today. So the the change of atmospheric CO2 concentration, so it's related to both the transport and the surface carbon fluxes and like surface source and sinks that you uh, you you, you uh, explain here. So over Sahara Desert, if it doesn't have vegetation. That that means that is not a big carbon sink, and also doesn't have much of human uh, fossil fuel emissions. So it's a lot a big source. So. In some some of some of the natural carbon flux and the fossil fuel emission is really small over that region. So the same, you, what you see the change of atmospheric CO2 concentration over Sahara Desert is really due to the atmospheric transport. So the the CO2 transport from the other region also the change of the weather patterns, and then you see the change of a uh, change of atmospheric CO2 concentration over that region. Thank you. This is a good question. Great. Question number six, can a city land parcel or a designated area for agroforestry be tracked if it has become a carbon sink? Can a village or agricultural land parcel be tracked for carbon credits? And uh, so this is a, a very loaded question. Okay. Different components who would like yeah. to see a step-by-step -step guide or process document and how this can be implemented. And do you have a case study? Um, I don't have a case study in mind, but I, um, but this is really a great question related to the carbon climate policy. So in currently there are several ways, several methods that you can use to estimate the carbon sink due to uh, afforestation or your land use change. Uh, one, one way that you can use atom, atmospheric CO2 concentration combined with modeling, as we talk about today, so you can combine the atmospheric CO2 concentration and the top-down inversion modeling to estimate the carbon uh, changes in your area. So our team has uh, generated a country-scale um, carbon budget that's published by uh, Burn at all 2023. I um, included the reference in the Google Doc. Based on this uh, data set, you can calculate the carbon sink over the area that you are interested. Um, but bear in mind, um, because we use atmospheric CO2 concentration um, that has very large footprint. So if that means like you are sensitive to an uh, area on the order of a few hundred kilometers. So that means that we are more confident on the carbon sink estimates over a large region, like a few hundred kilometers instead of a few kilometers. So that's the caveat you need to keep in mind. So another way that you can use to track carbon sink is through the biomass estimates. And the biomass estimates is a very, very active research area. And I also included a reference um, in the Google Doc so in that reference, you can see, you can find the global biomass estimates at a very fine spatial resolution, but it has relatively coarser temporal resolution. So it has annual, uh, annual um, temporal resolution. And the third way that you can use to estimate carbon stock change is the way is the uh, manual that published by United Nations Framework on Climate Change, UNFCCC. So they have the detailed um, documentation about how you could assess the stock change using the land area and the uh, emission uh, factors. And also I include a reference in the Google Doc. Um, if you have questions and you want to learn more, please feel free to contact those that have published those methods. If you are uh, have questions about top-down uh, inversion method that our team has published, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Wonderful. Next question, number seven. Can you give an intuitive sense of the rate of lateral transport compared to local sinks and sources? Yeah, um, this, um, so, I mean, really this, I really try to emphasize the importance of counting for lateral, tra lateral transport when you look at the, um, the CO2 data from OCO2. It really depends on the region. 
So for a large point source or mega city such as Los Angeles, um, the CO2 enhancement, that's, that means like due to the local uh, fluxes, could be a few parts per million, could be two or three parts per million on some days, like one is also related to transport. If the air is really uh, still, really quiet, doesn't have much of a wind, the wind speed is really slow. That means the all the emissions just stay in that area that you could see the CO2 enhancement be a few parts per million, like such as Los Angeles. And some large power plant also could see a few parts per million. But I, you also have to remember like the, um, the magnitude of CO2 concentration now is more than 410 parts per million. So that means, I mean, it's really accumulation over a long time period. But then on another note, then the, on the annual scale, the atmospheric CO2 increase average is about 2.5 parts per million. And that's the sum of all the emissions and the carbon sinks over the globe. The local contribution to this 2.5 parts per million increase really depends on the magnitude of your emission in your area. So say if your emission is like 1,000th of this total emission, that means you only contribute to 1,000th of this 2.5 parts per million increase. Um, of course, I think for, for, uh, for in a single day, I mean, that's really, you could be like a point on the order of few uh, on the order of few parts per million or you cannot even notice it really depends on the the magnitude of a local emission thank you okay thanks uh question number eight now the next couple of questions seem to all be focused on the demo so let's uh, uh start with number eight why install x-ray and net CDF4 library. Doesn't X-Array support and, uh, NC files? It does. And that, yes, that's a great question. Uh, so the scope of our notebook development was to keep it as simple as possible using the, the most basic net CDF4 library, although we do provide X-Array as an optional package in our environment.yaml file that can be uh, installed through Conda. Uh, that leverages a, additional extended features exclusive to X-Array, things like uh, X, uh, S3 access for more cloud-based computing, things like that. Um, but uh, we wanted to leave that up to the user to decide how to use that. Uh, but we do, I, I did drop in a link there. You can see it in the document uh, to some ad additional helpful resources uh, provided by Jesdisk. They have their own GitHub tutorials repo. Uh, in there, you'll find some examples of how to use X-Array if that's something that's new to you. But the hope is that uh, the package will provide it for folks who are already familiar with X-Array. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, so, so I think we just wanted to keep this as simple as possible uh, for, the, for the purpose of what we're trying to show in this demonstration. Thanks, David. Question number nine, can I download the CO2 data for a specific region or just clip the NCDF, NetCDF file? Yes, so I'm going to mostly punt this over to Karen, if that's okay, but I, I understand this can be done in open app, and I believe the part three demo next week will go into that. Uh, Karen, did you want to touch yeah. on that a little bit more? Um, and then I, I put the disclaimer in there, if you will, um, the, for the person who asked the question, when we say specific region, I think it's very important because anything that you pull is by lat long and you'll be able to download information for an area, but is just mindful of uh, the, the footprint. So I, um, I think that both Vivian and Ginger had illustrated this or talked about this and um, Abhishek, Dr. Chatterjee will talk about it more next week. It's just you have to be mindful of um, what you mean by region because it does matter um, how big the area is. And, um, and, and and next week, you once we grab the data from OCO3, you'll be able to pick specifically lat long. We do show that next week. Um, and that would be the closest we have for as far as a region. Um, or a more fine scale region. I hope that answers the question because I, I don't know what they mean when they say specific region, but I wanted to caution that. Thank you, Karen. I think um, uh, the way I interpret this is perhaps, you know, defining a region through a lat long or through a shape file. 
specifically? I know oh. some, some data sets have that sort of option. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> well, you have to come back for next week, I guess. Because <laughs> um, uh, the activity that we show um, through OpenDAP, um, we do pick by, um, the, the notebook will allow you to actually determine if there's a spe specific city you want to look at. And um, depending if there's data or not, we will be able to show that. So we will have that as an example next week. Okay, thank you. Moving on then to question number 10, it looks like uh, that was left blank. So question 11, if we load these notebooks in Google Colab, will the download script work there or will we face any authenticate, authenticate, <laughs> authentication errors? Yeah, this is an excellent question. So, so we haven't a disclaimer, another disclaimer here. We haven't tested these notebooks in Google Colab that was out of the scope of this particular um, uh, training tutorial. However, uh, because it uses HTTPS based download, it's not, for example, going direct to S3 and using some sort of proprietary cloud based way of downloading the data. It's using a pretty generic way of downloading it. It should theoretically work in any platform that uh, as long as you're running Jupyter in that platform and in, in that environment and you have the dependencies uh, and, and the modules that you've installed through the environment YAML file, theoretically, it should work fine. Uh, the notebook does generate the credentials uh, authentication that you need to authenticate. So, again, I, I haven't personally tested that out, but in theory, it should work. Um, I will say you do need to make sure you also set up a uh, Earth Data login account in advance. Uh, Karen showed you that in the slide deck just before the, the demo uh, and make sure that your credentials are working. That's probably the most important thing you want to do first. Yeah, I can say I did. Um, we didn't test for these particular notebooks, but in the past, uh, we could go interchangeably between Colab and GitHub. So that shouldn't be uh, a problem. Wonderful. Okay, question then number 12. Is there any training data related to CO2 measurements oriented to test machine learning algorithms? such as data cubes, data sets, et cetera? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start off by saying I'm not aware of any, um, but I, I did locate a generic uh, ML training um, uh, repo that is already on the GitHub repo that I dropped in there. It's very generic. I don't know a whole lot about it, uh, but I'll just stop here and, and maybe punt this over to Junji or Karen if they have more to add. Um. So I will start. So for from the OCO2, OCO3 project, we don't have any training data set reserved for machine learning or algorithms. But I think the for the question 13 has to be related. Um, Eric, should I um, continue with question 13 or I could uh, wait till uh, question 13? Sure, go ahead. Let me just read it. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so this ties into, go ahead and, and continue then. Yeah, so, I mean, we don't have any training data set uh, that's reserved for machine learning, but this is really a very active research area. Um, so both for both the CO2 concentration and also for the fluxes, I, I included several references in the Google Doc, which you could check out later. Basically, uh, the community has been using the OCO2 data and other uh, input data and the machine lear learning methods trying to uh, have global CO2 concentration coverage. I mean, as you have learned from today and yesterday, the CO2 only observe uh, a stripe of the atmosphere. So the spatial coverage, even though we um, observe the whole globe, but it has big gap. So the community is trying to use the machine learning method to fill these gaps using other um, other data sets and also the machine learning techniques. Great, thank you. That's, that's great insight, thanks for that. Question number 14, is there a way to connect and get the data through Google Earth Engine? Yeah, I, I think this was touched on briefly yesterday. I think there is a way to do it. However, we, we did not incorporate that as within the scope of this training. Um, and we, as we explained yesterday, we mentioned that it would be up to the user to do that. 
uh, using their preferred data sets. Um, and uh, we, we did talk about uh, raster file formats briefly yesterday as well, such as GeoTIFF. Um, and as the OCO2 data sets that you saw today and the OCO3 data sets that you'll see next week are both natively provided in that CDF format, it would be incumbent upon the user to do their own file format conversion uh, using their preferred tools to do so, which do exist. Um, and uh, so, so I think that um, there's others that, uh, I think Erica, you, you were gonna comment on other resources that our set already has out there that are more general perhaps that could be extended to these types of data sets. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you did include a link there David on question number 12 on a machine learning fundamentals that RSET has done and that I believe that did use Google Earth Engine and many of our trainings RSET trainings do use Google Earth Engine more than anything it's to take advantage of all of the data sets that are already sitting on Google Earth Engine so um, it's especially useful to do time series analysis because it's all done in the cloud um, in the case of OCO2 and OCO3 data, uh, definitely a user can upload the data onto Google Earth Engine. They would need to uh, convert it into a GeoTIFF because that's what Google Earth Engine um, identifies. However, I don't know what is the, um, how it would work if you have a large time series data set. Um, it might be a, a little bit burdensome. So that's as much as I can say in terms of using Google Earth Engine. But yes, you can, if you have a couple of files that are in GeoTIFF, then you can certainly upload them to, to that platform. Um, anything else to add on that, uh, David or Karen? Uh, yeah, I don't really have anything to add uh, substantively, but maybe it would be good to also have a resource there for a point of contact at Google Earth Engine for users who um, who uh, need to reach out to them for support. That might be a helpful resource. Yeah, absolutely. And I think moving forward, as we think of uh, future trainings, we could include a component. Um, that walks participants on how to go through this process of uh, converting to a GeoTIFF and then uploading it to Google Earth Engine, converting a, you know, an XCO2 file into a GeoTIFF file. Um, all right, let's move on to question number 15. The data has a core spe spatial resolution. Are there any methods such as downscaling that can increase this resolution? And what are the parameters, such as environmental factors, that would need to be considered when choosing a method to enhance the spatial resolution? Yeah, so I, I could take a first shot at this. Uh, so I'm assuming they're referring, even though the question doesn't say, I'm assuming they're referring to the OCO2 notebook, which does have uh, that data natively is pretty coarse. And so we we used a uh, a binning, a selective binning um, to relatively coarse at five by five degree lat log resolution using nearest neighbor. Uh, we didn't really scope into the training uh, any kind of rescaling to higher resolutions uh, for this particular uh, training exercise. Uh, however, uh, maybe Junjie or Karen have done that in the past, or maybe maybe this is something that is an active. Uh, ongoing research activity that I'm not aware of. So I'll, I'll stop here and, and see if they can chime in on that. Um, I can chime in on this. I think this probably, I mean, the, uh, the question was about fill the data gaps between the different um, OCO2 orbits. I think we can refer to question 13. I mean, from the OCO2 project, we have a level three product that level three products um, generated by data assimilation methods. So basically you combine the models with observations through the data simulation, trying to fill the data gaps. And another way you can fill the data gaps is through machine learning methods. Um, the main um, input environmental factor that have to be considered are the winds. I mean, they're really trying to uh, consider transport. I will refer you to uh, question 13 to find out more references on that. I mean, official, we don't have official 
machine learning product, but the, the science community has generated uh, several. Thank you. Great. Question then number sixteen. Are all data that you're using in the demo available online? Yes, and I started putting in a link there for the OCO2 uh, data site uh, landing page. Uh, yes, they are. Uh, and, and if you go to the notebooks, which you'll be getting in your homework assignments, and I'll, I'll drop the other links directly in this answer sheet as well. Uh, the, the, the top markdown cell of each of those notebooks will also contain the direct links on how to get to the publicly accessible data sets. Great, so moving on then to question number 17, the white areas, do they mean there's there are no fluxes? And if so, why? So I think I'm gonna defer some of this to Junji later. Uh, I'll take a first shot at this. Uh, so I think it just depends on the flux product you're using. So it could be due to missing data over land, which would be obviously the case for the ocean product, or maybe it's uh, data that's not available over the oceans, which would also be the case for the, uh, the net biosphere exchange product. Um, in areas where we expect um, to see fluxes, uh, there will be a white area there uh, in between the red, the red, the shades of red and the shades of blue to separate between the positive and negative fluxes. Those would be what I would consider to be the near zero fluxes. So they may not be actually zero, but near zero in that white range. But I'll defer to Junjay uh, uh, to explain further if it's needed. Um, I think David, you explained it really well. Um, so basically, I mean the is if it's near zero fluxes for the uh, overland for the MBE product, that means that the flux is close to zero. So it has physical meaning. So it's close to zero. There is an almost zero, um, almost no fluxes. Um, I think for the flux part, we don't have missing values. So because it's the it's generated by the uh, model, it doesn't have missing values. So it's outfield. So zero does mean um, no fluxes. Okay, question number 19. Can you please advise what's the best methodology to estimate above ground carbon stock for cropland and grassland? Um, so NASA has another mission called JIDAI. Uh, it's an ecosystem LIDAR. It's also on uh, International Space Station. So the, that mission specifically um, aimed to quantify the above ground biomass for forest. I'm not sure about the gra grass, grassland and the cropland. You need to check out later um, for the references. And also I put a reference that uh, um, that estimates the global biomass using LIDAR, radar, and the ground measurements and the machine learning approach that generates the global uh, terrestrial live biomass over 21st century. I assume that includes both uh, the, the biomass for both cropland and grassland. And you can check out the reference later in the Google Doc. Okay, question number 19, between NPP and GPP, which one is okay to use to estimate carbon stocks? So, um, I mean, GPP is really the gross primary production that represents the amount of carbon fixed through photosynthesis. And NPP is the difference between GPP and the rate and the carbon released through the um, uh, metallism and the maintenance respiration. So it's the NPP is the amount of carbon fixed by the plants. And the NPP can be used to estimate carbon stock, but the NPP is represents flux so that you, you really have to integrate the NPP over a time period to get carbon stock change. So it's really carbon stock change, it's not really the carbon stock. Okay. Uh, question number 20, why is there a large carbon sink over land in 2022? Oh, that's a good question, great question. Um, we, I mean, in the first part, we talk about the drought, the impact of drought on the on the carbon fluxes. I mean, 2015, 2016 is a El Nino year um, that caused big drought over the tropical region. So that has reduced the carbon sink. 
Well, on the opposite of the El Nino is La Nina. So 2022 is by is at the end of the La Nina year. We haven't done the detailed analysis, but I um, hypothesize that the 2022 is due to the large carbon sink caused by the La Nina events. Of course, I think this is needs some more detailed analysis um, from the community or the team. Okay, question 21. I'm not sure if this is clear enough, but do you know uh -huh. of any AI applications that do this? Not sure what, what this is, but do you want to take a stab? Um, yeah, I, I think I could say, I mean, if you mean, I mean, artificial, the machine learning has been applied to estimate the CO2 concentration. And also the community has been started to use machine learning to estimate carbon fluxes. But this is really a very active research area and just getting started. I haven't seen any um, published reference that they use machine learning to quantify the carbon fluxes yet. Um, but there are several studies that use machine learning to estimate concentration. Okay, question 22. We discussed some of this previously. Can we export the data to TIFF similar to JPEG? Um, let's see. And analyze changes in CO2 for a specific time period. Yeah, so I could take a shot at this one. Uh, so we sort of addressed some of this in the Google Earth Engine question above. Um, and and well, once again, to remind folks, while we didn't develop or test our notebooks uh, to do anything with TIFF or do any TIFF conversions or GeoTIFF conversions, uh, I did uh, locate um, a open source one example of an open source solution. I'm sure there's others out there in Python that can be incorporated into a Jupyter notebook. And so I provided that example there, but with a disclaimer that this hasn't been tested, so it's kind of like a use at your own risk kind of thing. Uh, what we feature in our notebooks are uh, proven open source uh, capabilities that um, have already been tested and, and proven to work really well. And so that's why I'm, I'm kind of putting that as a, a cautionary disclaimer um, with that, so. Great, Great thank you for, for that reference, yeah. Question 23, can we use the analysis outlined today to gain insight on areas that might be on the verge of desertification? I would say yes. Um, so we um, talk about concentration and the fluxes. So if you, if the area is on the verge of desertification, you could see the change of the current fluxes. You could use the data product we shared with you today and the some tools, you could look at how the fluxes has been changing in the last decade and how is that related to the change of climate factors or the human activity. And then you probably could infer what would happen if the climate on certain trajectory. I think certainly this is a very good application area. I would really, highly encourage you to explore how you could use the data to address this question. Okay, so we're running here toward the end. How about one more question? What should be considered when comparing and interpreting OCO2 and 3XCO2 data with ground-based remote sensing and model observations? This is a very good question. Um, so, I remember that the OCO2, OCO3 observations column integrated concentration. And uh, yesterday, Vivian talked about averaging kernel that represents sensitivity of this column to the CO2 at different vertical levels. So when you um, uh, compare the column CO2 concentration with ground-based remote sensing and model observation, you should take into account of the averaging kernels and the weighting functions that provided as part of the level two data set. Um, I think when you compare with column with ground based, uh, with the, I mean, special surface data is a little bit tricky because surface just represent a surface signal, while co column XO2 represents column, in, uh, column integrated value. So on the bottom, um, 
um, bottom line, you really should consider the averaging kernels. Okay, so we have come to the top of the hour here. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to all of your questions. However, we will be answering these questions on the Google Doc and we'll be posting the Google Doc onto the training webpage in a couple of days. Just to remind you that we will also be posting the recording of today's presentation and the PDF of the presentation on the training webpage. Uh, there is one more session as part of this series. It will be on Tuesday, March 6, uh, March, July 16th, and it will be focused on the use of OCO3 measurements to look at CO2 in urban areas. So with that, I uh, would like to thank our invited instructors today, Dr. Junji Liu, Karen Yuan, and Dav David Moroni as well as the RSET team for their support, and of course, to all of the participants for, for uh, continued enthusiasm and great questions today. Before I close, I'd like to um, give the opportunity to our speakers to give some final words um, uh, for today's session. So, uh, uh, Dr. Liu, would you like to chime in? Yeah, um, I really thank you. All of you for uh, participating participating today's uh, training session. I feel so honored to share this training course with all of you. I feel I hope this is really um, the beginning of your journey with OCO two OCO three observation. And if you have more questions and uh, um, comments, please feel free to reach out. I am so honored to see so many people from all over the world to dial in. And also, I want to thank the uh, our training team for the support and David and Karen for pulling together such a wonderful uh, exercise. And also want to thank Eric to host this uh, training session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David, would you like to say some words? Yes, uh, thank you again for having me uh, be part of this really awesome opportunity and this, this awesome exercise. Uh, I actually learned a lot from this myself. I hope you all did as well. Uh, please don't be shy. Please reach out if you have any questions. My email address is right there, um, and also on on GitHub, uh, the repo. Uh, all of the code is open source, um, and, and uh, I believe it's the using the Apache 2.0 license, if I remember correctly. Uh, so, so you're welcome to reuse the code uh, as much as you would like. Um, and yes, uh, looking forward to seeing what comes from here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Karen, any words from you? Thank you so much for joining us. It's really always a pleasure and I'm very fortunate to work with a great bunch of people and hope to see you all next week. Thank you very much. And we will see all of you hopefully uh, next Tuesday. Wishing you all a great day and until then, bye-bye.